chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and then Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to read a couple of verses today, and, uh, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to sharing this Word. Uh, we're just, uh, we're really believing for God to speak to us today. Amen. In honor of God's Word, I'm going to ask you to please one more time, let's rise, let's stand, and let's just read a couple of verses we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into the Word. Amen. We're doing our Empowered series. We're empowered by the Spirit of God. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6 and 7. The verse says this, it says, When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women, uh, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 says this, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives us the desires that are opposite, uh, is opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Let's pray. Father God, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and I ask God that you would give us an ear to hear. Father, give us a heart to receive, Lord. I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that, that Father, less of, less of me and more of you, not my words, but your words, not my thoughts, but your thoughts, God. Have your way in this place, Lord. Thank you, God. If there's any obstacle, if there's anything that gets in our way from, from receiving what you have for us, I pray, God, that you would remove it Jesus, Lord, speak to every heart. In, in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody says, Amen. You may be seated today. Praise God. You know, the, the story of, of David and Saul is an interesting story. Many of us, if you've grown up in the church, or maybe you know a little bit about, you know, the Bible, or maybe you went to kids' church when you were younger, uh, you, you remember the story of, of David. And we know the story of David, but there was also somebody in David's life that was always pursuing him, and that was Saul. And so the story of David, uh, uh, David and Saul is very interesting. And, and I don't want to take it for granted today that everybody knows the story of David and Saul, right? So I want to give you a quick, a quick overview of the story of David and Saul and how all this began and, and what led up to their, to their conflict and, and all of these things. And so if you just bear with me just for a couple of moments, I want to just give you a brief overview of the story of King Saul and, and David. So one day, uh, God's people... Uh, they noticed that all the, the, the nations around them, that surrounded them, they all had a king minus, minus them. They didn't have a king. And so they really wanted a king like all the other nations. And one day, God finally answered their request. And he says, okay, I'm going to give you a king, the king that you've been wanting. And, and he goes to one of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and he selects Saul to be the king. Now, when everybody saw uh, Saul, he looked the part. He had the stature. He had the influence. He had the physique. He had the makeup. I mean, if, if ever there was anybody who looked like a king, it was Saul. And so when God selected Saul, right, to be king, everybody celebrated. We finally have a king. They, they, celebrated, they celebrated Saul as king. But something happened after Saul became king. He started out okay. He started out good, actually. But all of a sudden, he began to deviate from what God wanted him to do, right? How many of you know it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish, amen? You can come and, and your Sunday can be great, but if you're not doing so great by Friday, come on, Sunday meant nothing, amen? Can I, can I get an amen? So your, your Sundays matter, but your Saturday nights matter too. Can I get an amen? And so Saul had a good start, he just didn't have a good finish. And so in between his start and his finish, right, he started out good, but something happened in his life where he began to deviate from the plans and the will of God. And he began doing things his own way. In fact, he began, to listen, he began listening to other voices other than the voice of God. And on many occasions when God would confront him, right, and God would confront his disobedience, there were many times where he would say, but the people said. And so, and so what, what we see in the life of King Saul is that he would, there was this subtle rebellion towards the things of God. He began to do things his way. All right, and not God's way. And because of that, God finally said, that's it. You are no longer the man that I have chosen, right? And I will raise up another man. 
And so the Bible says that it's at that moment that he sent the prophet Samuel to go look for the next king of Israel. And so he took him to, to the house of Jesse. And there the Bible says that he, he, he chose the runt of the litter. He chose the, the smallest son, the youngest son, the one that nobody acknowledged, the one that nobody wanted to, to acknowledge. It says that he chose David to be the next king of Israel. But there, was only, there was a problem. There was already a king of Israel. His name was Saul. And Saul was the king. And so David now became the king in waiting. Now remember, remember this, that, that when kings were selected, the prophets would go and pour oil over them. That symbolized the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so at that time, there were two men that were anointed to be king of Israel. It was Saul and David. And so one day... Uh, as after Saul had this falling out with God, or God, you know, basically says, you're not my man anymore. The Bible says that Saul began uh, to be tormented, that he began to have trouble, like he couldn't sleep, he couldn't be at peace, he couldn't be at rest. And so the only thing that would, would pacify him or calm him down was music, was beautiful music. And so one day somebody went to, to Saul and said, well, there's a, there's a really good musician out in the fields. He's really talented and he writes these beautiful songs. You should bring him in, and, and he'll help calm your spirit down. So they brought him in, and that, that person, that young man, was David. And so David, every time he would play that harp and play his songs or that string instrument, the Bible says that it would calm Saul down. And so that's how Saul and David were introduced. Now, that was, a, that was the, the, what I would call the, the, the private, right, the, the private uh, moment or the, the, the private moment when, when uh, David was known by the king. But then there came a public moment where he wasn't only known by the king, but he became known to everybody. And that was when he faced Goliath. How many of you remember the story of David and Goliath, right? The Bible says that there was a Philistine champion, a giant, and his name was Goliath. And he, every day he would go out into the battlefield and he would taunt, he would challenge, he would defy the armies of God. He would defy his people. And he'd say, send me a champion. And, and, and he was so big and he was so intimidating that no one would want to, to rise up to stand against Goliath because he was this massive warrior, a massive Philistine champion. And one day when David was visiting his brothers who were in Saul's army, King Saul's army, it says that David heard him and he became upset and, and, and he says, I'll take, I'll take the challenge. Who is this man who defies God, basically, right? And so he, he rises up to the challenge. You guys know the story. He confronts the, the champion. He, he confronts uh, 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 Goliath. And, and all of a sudden, he, he kills him, right? And, and then God's army then advances, or God's people's army advance. They, they wipe out the Philistines, and there's great victory. And the Bible says that everything is great, and, and, and the people are celebrating. And, and because of that great victory, David is promoted into the, into the army, right? It's to be one of uh, King Saul's right-hand men. But there's a problem. There's an issue, because when they're coming back from battle one day, as we just read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, when they're coming back, I want you to see this and imagine this for just a moment. There is King Saul with his crown on his horse or whatever he's riding, right? And there he is coming back from battle, right? And the Bible says that the ladies, that the, the community are celebrating him. And they began to shout and say, Saul has killed his thousands. Now think about that. How many of you know that killing thousands is not, if you're a warrior, that's pretty good. Come on, somebody, amen? I mean, that's awesome, right? You have killed your thousands. You have vanquished your thousands. You are a mighty warrior. And imagine how Saul must have felt at this moment where the people are singing the praises of Saul. Like they're, they're like, they're giving him credit for the warrior that he is. But the song didn't end there, right? It says, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed 10,000s. And so from that day forward, there was, this, there was this conflict between Saul and David. Saul had it out for David. Why? Because David was a threat. David became a, a threat, right, to his kingship, to his reign. And so from that day forward, King Saul began to pursue David, to kill him, because he viewed him as a threat. Now, in this relationship, in this relationship between Saul and David, listen to me because this is really the main theme of this message. And if you don't get this, you're not going to get anything else that I'm telling you right now. But in this message, listen to what I'm about to say. Saul and David, listen, that relationship represents something in your life, in my life. Because how many of you know that, that vanquishing and conquering thousands of enemies is pretty impressive? Would you agree with that? 
But how many of you know that 10,000 enemies is more impressive? Amen. Watch this. Saul represents, hear me, Saul represents what you can do in the flesh, while David represents what you can do in the spirit. See, there is no denying that Saul was talented. There was no denying that Saul was a gifted man. He, he had the stature. He had the influence to be the king. In fact, you know, he was selected king not by the people. He was not selected king by Samuel. He was selected king by God. God chose him. So he had the influence. He had the stature. More importantly, he had the favor of God in his life. He was selected by God to be king. But something happened, right? Something happened. He deviated and he began to depend on his own self. He began to, 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 uh, to depend on his, and his wisdom and his strength and, and what he wanted to do. And so what ends up happening is, is when he selected king, it's an obvious choice. Everybody knows, man, this guy looks the part. But then David comes on the scene and the choice wasn't so obvious. He didn't look the part. He didn't have the stature. He didn't have the influence. In fact, he was tucked away probably somewhere in a pasture somewhere taking care of his father's sheep. So he didn't have the influence. He didn't have the stature, right? But how many of you know that God is not looking at the exterior of somebody? He's not looking at what you can do in the flesh. My friend, he wants to know, are you willing to surrender your life to the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Amen. Because Saul, listen, Saul represents what you can do in the flesh. There are people in this room that are extremely gifted and talented. And I praise God for that. I thank God that you are gifted. I thank God that you are talented. But can I be honest with you? Sometimes you depend on that gifting and talent and that talent more than you depend on the Holy Spirit. That's why God can do sometimes more with someone who's less gifted and less talented because they have to depend on him. Are you hearing me today? When someone is less gifted and less talented, they understand that, guess what? It's not about what they can do. It's about what God can do through them. And so there is, there is that, that conflict in our lives, right? Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. We just read it just a while ago. It says this at the very end. It says that these two forces, what forces? The flesh and the Spirit of God. The flesh and the Spirit of God are constantly fighting one another. Do you ever feel like that, like there's this inner conflict in your life? That you want to do good, but the flesh is saying, do bad. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? Like there's that inner conflict in you. You want to do good for God. You want to pursue the things of God. You want to pursue his will. You want to pursue his plans, his purpose for your life. But there's this conflict in you, and you're, and you're being pulled this way by the flesh, and you're being pulled this way by the spirit. And so in each and every one of our lives, there's this, there's this eternal conflict that's happening, right? It's the battle between the flesh and the flesh. And the spirit, I like to call it this. For today's sake, let's call it this. It's the, the pretend life versus the power life. See, that's really what it's about. It's about the pretend life and the power life. We're living in a day and age where many people, listen, many individuals are celebrating their pretend life. What do I mean by that? Let me th just think for just a moment. Think about this. How many people today will take selfies in this world? How many, how many bloggers do we have out there? How many Instagrammers do we have out there that are professional posters? I don't know what you even want to call them. They post for a living. I know people. I know people. Listen, I've heard of people. I don't know them personally. Now, I think it's a, if you can get the job, well, then praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. But there are people that are professional posters, right? They just go places and they just post pictures and they get sponsored and they travel the world. And Can I tell you something? That is not the real life, Right? They're not, it's not the real life. In fact, just this week I was, I was reading in the news where one of these, one of these individuals who's a professional, you know, uh, Instagrammer, whatever you want to call him, right, uh, YouTuber, watch this. Uh, what ended up happening is, is that their pictures, they noticed that it was the same clouds in the back of every picture. And they said, how has that happened? It's because it's not real. It's pretend. How many of you know that when you take a picture, you can filter it, you can crop it, the way you position your face? Come on, it's all about the angles. Can I get an amen? amen. I was with a group of pastors one day, and they asked me to take a picture with, uh, for them, and they all took a picture, and I took a picture, and then the pastor came up to me and says, hey, you know what I need you to do? He goes, I need you to take another one, but you need to take a, a picture from up high because the angle down here doesn't work for me. Yeah, I'm like... Come on. 
had another pastor one time say he was invited to speak at a church and he said I had seen all their pictures I had seen their posts on Instagram of their social media of their church and I thought I was going to this massive church and I walked in and there was less than 50 people <laughs> and I'm like what is that I was thinking to myself well, is that what is that what inspires you is, is that is it just the crowds or, or what <laughs> It's the pretend life versus the power life. You see, every one of us in this room, we can take a picture and make it seem, come on, that we're 50 pounds lighter. You don't have to shout me down. Right? Come on. You ever heard of Photoshop? I like to call it Slim Shop. Come on, somebody. Slims you down. Amen. It's the pretend life versus the power life. And what's happened is, is think about this for just a moment. We have a generation of young people. We have a generation of children who are growing up with that mentality. And so when they come to church and we're talking about the real power of God, they think they can crop out things of their life and still walk in the power. And then you, you hear things like, well, you can fake it till you make it. There is no such thing like faking it till you make it. God never called us to fake anything. God never called us to fake the power of God. He never fake, called us to fake holy living and righteous living. Come on. He never called us to fake love and compassion and peace. He called us to the real deal. Amen. It's the pretend life versus the power life. And today, you and me, we have to choose. Am I going to live the pretend life or am I going to live the power life? It's that battle. It's that tension between that's in, inside of us. As long as we're alive here on earth, the flesh is going to be pulling us. It's going to try to tempt us. It's going to try to drive us into living the pretend life. But God is saying, listen, I've given you the spirit. Come on, somebody. I've given you the spirit so that you can live the power life. Can I get an amen today? Amen. It's that struggle. So today I want to share with you three things very quickly. The pretend life, the pretend life seeks to, to, to be served. The power life seeks to serve. Let me say that again. The pretend life seeks to be served. The power life seeks to serve. I want you to think about this for just a moment. Here Goliath is threatening God's people over and over again. And Saul did nothing about it. The king of Israel did nothing about it. You want to know why he did nothing about it? Because he was wanting somebody else to step up. He wanted somebody else to make the sacrifice. He wanted somebody else to do the fighting. He wanted somebody else to, to get the victory. But he wasn't willing to do it himself. He was waiting for somebody to come and hand it to him. He was saying, I'm, I'm here in the palace. Somebody go and kill that Goliath. Someone go and overcome and have victory over him. And when you do, come to the palace and give me the victory. So watch this. He was waiting to be served. But David, David was different. Upon hearing the threats of Goliath, he spoke up. And not only did he speak up, but he, he stepped up. Come on. He spoke up and he stepped up to the plate. And after he stepped up to the plate, he says, listen, you're not defying these people. You're not defying this nation. You're not even defying me. Who you're defying is the Lord God Almighty. See, he understood that. He didn't wait for somebody else to step up to the plate. He did it himself. You see, I believe and with all my heart, I believe this with all my heart, that there were two people who could have defeated Goliath. Just two. David was one of them. But you want to know who the other one was? Saul. You want to know why I believe Saul could have defeated Goliath? Because he had something on his life that nobody else other than David had. You, don't want, to, you want to know what that was? It was called the anointing. He had been anointed the king. And because he had the anointing of God on his life, doesn't the scripture tell us that no one will touch my anointed one of God? Doesn't God say no one will touch my anointed? So watch this. He had the anointing. He had the power of God on him and in him. Yet, listen, because he wasn't willing to serve, because he had a bad attitude, because he, because he didn't see it, listen, he was oblivious to the fact that the power of God was in his life. And he could have stepped up to, to the plate. And guess what? He could have vanquished Goliath. Why? Because there was an anointing on his life, and God wasn't going to let Goliath touch him. If you notice, if you notice when David steps up to the plate, Goliath never lays a finger on him. He never lays a, a hand on him. Why? Because God says in his word, no one will touch my anointed one. All, had, all, God, all Saul had to do was show up and have some faith. Come on, somebody. And remember who he was. 
He forgot who he was. Saul had power at his disposal. He had the authority at his disposal. But he was waiting for somebody else to do the work. My friend, the pretend life, listen, the pretend life is you saying, let somebody else do the work. Let somebody else do the service. Let somebody else do the praying. Let somebody else serve God. Let somebody else lead the life group. Let somebody else do it. But you don't know that God is giving you the spirit so that you can do it. See, the power life says, listen, I didn't, I, didn't come to, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to make a difference. I came to make a difference in this community. I came to serve my church. I came to serve this community, the less fortunate in this community. I came to serve the nations of the world. I come to serve my neighbor, my, my, my per, the person sitting next to me. I'm here to serve, not to be served. Why? Because the pretend life says, serve me. But the power life says, let me serve. That's why God anoints us. He anoints us. He empowers us to serve. See, number two, the pretend life plays it safe. The power life takes bold steps of faith. See, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Saul and David found themselves in two completely different places. Saul was in the safety of his palace, sitting on his throne. But David was on the front lines. One place was safe. And one place was dangerous. But can I tell you something about the safe place? At the safe place, listen, it's a place of safety and comfort. In the place of safety and comfort, can I tell you something? No battles are ever fought. And if no battles are ever fought in safety, listen, then that means that there's no victories won in safety either. Come on. Nothing is gained in a place of safety. You want to know what safety does for you? It preserves self. That's all, that's all safety does. Safety preserves self. Think about that for just a moment. See, Brother Sal said it just a while ago up here on the interview, right? He says, what have we been learning? You've been hearing this for the last, I don't know how many months, years, for the last couple of years, I know. Die to self. Die to self. What did Jesus say to those who wanted to follow him? He says, if you want to be my disciples, listen, you're going to have to take up your cross daily and follow me what was he saying he was saying you're gonna have to die to self every day not just on Sundays not just on Sundays when there's free burritos for breakfast come on somebody by the way great burritos come on somebody praise the Lord hallelujah I want you to know that I was dying to self when I was consuming that burrito Mm, with that salsa I don't know who made that salsa but if there's any left over I'm taking it home come on somebody I'm I'm making an executive decision as pastor. That salsa is mine. I have named it. I have claimed it. I have blabbed it. I'm going to grab it. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Are you hearing me today? Check this out. Here, Here he is. Saul, the anointed one, the king, the man with the stature, the man with the gifting, the man with the look. Yet he's playing it safe. Right? Why? Because he's all about preserving self. See? The pretend life says play it safe. The power life says take bold steps of faith. Because when we see David, we see that David doesn't play it safe. He takes a bold step of faith. He recognizes that God has empowered him. He recognizes that it's not David's reputation on the line. It's not the nation's reputation on the line. It's God's reputation on the line. Are you hearing me today? you got to understand something, that when you take bold steps of faith, it's not your name on the line. It's not, your tr- it's not Lifeway on the line. Come on. It's not you on the line. It's not your ministry on the line. You want to know what's on the line? The kingdom of God is on the line. It's not, a, it's not about advancing the pastor or the ministry or the church or yourself. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. And we're never going to advance the kingdom of God if we play it safe. We've got to take bold steps of faith. Because when I take bold steps of faith, I recognize that God has empowered me to advance the kingdom. This is what I love about our life groups. I know that you hear me talk about it all the time, but but it's, it's a fact. This is a fact, my friends, that every time we go and we have a life group in a coffee house, a restaurant, a, a home, wherever it is, listen, what we are doing is we are taking the kingdom of God and taking, we're taking possession of that place, amen? I know Starbucks, Starbucks pays for the rent, pays for the facility, but can I tell you something? When we walk in, that's kingdom place. Come on, somebody. And people are watching. The other day in my life group, we, we meet at an Italian restaurant. Come on. 
He said, why do you meet at an Italian restaurant? Because I ain't stupid. <laughs> I'm smart. They serve breakfast and lunch. Come on. We go at 10.30 because it's like, what do you want? Breakfast or lunch? You want whatever you want. You want pizza? There it is. But the other day we were in our life group and we're sitting around the table and the guys, listen, some people say, how do you open up? I mean, how do you talk in these places? We just easy. We just start talking. And we're not whispering, hey, God, you know, God's speaking to me about this. We're like, we're, we're talking, we're sharing. Some stuff is, is pretty personal. And the guys, I just give credit to my guys. They don't care who's there. They're just talking. And the other day we're talking, and I just noticed the people around us are like. <laughs> table across from us, the guys are like. We're about to pray, and they're like. The servers are walking by. You want to know what happened just a couple of weeks ago? One of our servers, right, as we're getting ready to leave, she comes and she stops me. The guys were waiting for me outside. And she comes and she stops me. She goes, can I talk to you? And I'm like, what, did my card, did my card bounce? My check, I'm sorry. So I, I promise there's money in there. I promise. I'm like, guys, can I tell you what happened to me yesterday? I forgot my wallet. I did. I want to thank Brother Nathan for buying me breakfast yesterday. He's like, I was sitting there and I was trying to, I was like, Lord, give me wisdom. What do I do? What do I do, Lord? And I was like, I, got, I know they're going to laugh at me. I says, guys, I forgot my wallet. And Nathan says, 10% interest. No, I'm playing. I'm joking. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. I'm joking. I'm joking. But check this out. The lady, that our server, she comes to us after, as we're walking out. This was a couple weeks ago. And she comes to us and she says, can I talk to you? He says, absolutely. She goes, she goes, I was hearing what you were saying. Oh, so you were, you were listening. And she goes, um, my husband's in trouble. And he's admitted right now. He's in, he's, in a, he's in a place right now and he's being mentally evaluated. He's got serious bipolar issues and, and some issues that you know, I won't even get into right now. And, and she began to tell me, and she starts crying in the restaurant. And all of a sudden, that restaurant, come on, turns into the house of the Lord. And so guess what we do? She goes, I, I was just wondering, can, can you pray for him? Can you keep him in your prayers? And I said, no. I, I said, I'm not only going to keep him in my prayers, but we're going to pray right now. Like, okay, okay. So we walked over by the bar, <laughs> the bar area. And now the bar area turns into the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody. And the guys are waiting for me outside, and we prayed, and I walk out, and I told them what happened, and I said, guys, let's pray right now. And so right there next to the, the main entrance of the restaurant, we all gathered in a circle, and we began praying, and people are walking by, walking into the restaurant. Why? Because there's a bold faith that says, listen, that is now God's territory. See, God doesn't reward safe. He rewards faith. Did you hear what I just said? He doesn't reward faith, he rewards, uh, he doesn't reward uh, safe, he rewards faith. See, I'm empowered to advance the kingdom. I'm empowered to pull down strongholds. I'm empowered to enforce victory. I'm empowered to live out God's purpose in my life. My friends, there are things, listen to me, I feel led by the Spirit to say this right now. There are things in your home, there are things in your family, in your children that are strongholds that God has empowered you to take down. And there's nothing wrong with having people, listen, there's nothing wrong with having people pray for you or, or excuse me, with you. But listen, there comes a moment where you're going to have to step up to the plate and exercise your faith. And you're going to have to begin to pull down those strongholds in your kids' lives, in your home, in your family. And break every stronghold that the enemy has wanted to, to come against in your life. Amen. See, that's the, that's the power life. That's the power life. How many of you know that when you're living the power life, man, you can have confidence. Amen. Like, okay, okay, this is what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to take bold steps of faith. See, number three, and finally, the pretend life. Listen, the pretend life pleases self and people. The power life pleases God. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up right now. The, pre the pretend life pleases self and people. The power life pleases God. One of the reasons that Saul lost the kingdom, he lost his kingship, he lost the favor of God is because he was more concerned with pleasing people than pleasing God. If you read 1 Samuel chapter 13, you'll discover that what he did was he listened to the people. God gave him a command, and he says, you need to wait. 
wait for me. The prophet of God said, wait for me, and we're going to sacrifice. We're going to make a sacrifice to commemorate the victory. And he waited, and he waited, and the, and the soldiers started getting uh, uh, restless. And the Bible says that he started worrying about the people. And the people, the soldiers started, like, leaving. And he, he felt like he was going to be in a vulnerable position. So he disobeyed because he was more worried about the people than he was, than he was about following God's command. Watch. Because, because Saul was insecure, listen to this. See, the reason, the, can I think about this for just a moment? The reason, the reason we, we, we try to please people, it's really about ourselves. Are you hearing me today? Because when I please people, what, what I'm looking for is people's validation. I need their approval because if they approve of what I'm doing or they approve of my gifts or they approve of me, then I must be okay. So we seek, we seek to please people. A people pleaser, listen, is always about self because they find, they find approval and validation in people. And that's where, that's where Saul was. Saul kept on trying to please people because he was literally insecure. In fact, little, little thing for you to research. When God found Saul, do you want to know what he was doing? He was hiding. He was hiding. Like they, he was hiding. They had to call him out from, from this place of hiding because I believe, listen, that there were the seeds of insecurity right there. Come on. And so all of a sudden, he becomes king, and cannot, that insecurity continued to develop to the point where he began worrying about the people and listening to the people. And so listen, as I said earlier, pleasing people is all about self-preservation. But David, listen, David's life was about pleasing God. It wasn't about pleasing people. See? It was about pleasing God. Listen to, to what I'm about to say. You don't need faith to please, to please people. In fact, pleasing people is impossible. You can't. You guys know this. If you've lived for any amount of time and you have followed the political scene and you followed politics in our nation, you know that if you try to please everybody, you'll please nobody. I mean, you, you just got to understand that there are some people who are going to like you and some people who are not. There are some people in your life, and I'm not talking about politics. I'm just talking about in general. There are some people who are for you and there's going to be some people who are not. That's just the way it is. Now, that doesn't mean that, that I brush people off and I don't care about people. No, it's, I understand that ultimately I'm called to please God. And if some people don't like me because I'm trying to please God, that's not my problem. That's their problem. That's their issue with God. You know, one of the things, listen to this. When you have a problem with authority in your life, you got to remember this, that that authority represents God. This is why God hates disobedience to parents. Listen to me, young people. Listen to me, young adults. The reason God hates dishonor and disobedience so much, listen to this, is because you're not just disobeying and dishonoring your parents. You're disobeying and dishonoring Him. Because He's placed that authority in your life. Come on, somebody. You honor authority. You honor the, the, the authority in your life. You speak to them with respect. You revere them. You, you love them. You respect them. You bless them. Because what goes around, comes around. See? You don't need faith to please people. In fact, it's impossible to please everybody. But you do need faith to please God. See, David's step of faith pleased God. And he says, I'm going to fight Goliath. I'm going to stand for you, God. I'm not only standing for this nation. I'm not only standing for this people, for this army. Lord, I'm standing for you. See, can I tell you something? Listen to me. Every time someone says... I'm going to serve in kids' church. I'm going to serve in the nursery. I'm going to serve out in a, in a parking lot. I'm going to serve in life groups. I'm going to, wherever it is that you serve, there's no place that's insignificant. What you are doing is you are fulfilling God's purpose for your life. You're saying, God, I'll serve you anywhere. See, if you find yourself constantly worried about people's opinions of you, you are living the pretend life. But if you desire to please God, He will empower you to live the power life. So what was, key, what was David's key? What was the key to his empowerment? It's found in Psalms 27, verse 1. The Bible says this. I believe it's on the screen. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? 
You want to know what the secret of his strength was? The secret of his strength was found in the presence of God. He valued God's presence and relied on it daily. My friend, you're here today, every ear on me and every eye on me for the next two minutes. You're here today and you've been running from God. But you need to know something. There's no place that you can run from God. Because you need to know this, that he has been, he's been running after you. He's been pursuing you. And today, you can experience the salvation of God. You can experience peace and joy and all those things that God promises you, the forgiveness. Today, you can have a brand new start. Today, listen, you, you may be here, and guess what? You walked in with a smile, but you know it wasn't real. Maybe, you, maybe you've been living the pretend life. You've been, trying to, you've been trying to cover up things in your life with things and more things and more relationships and more money and all those things, and you're still empty. You want to know why? Because it's not a real life. It's a pretend life. But today, today, God loves you. There's a God here that loves you, and He wants to be your salvation. He wants to be your life. So I'm believing that God's Spirit's going to reign on you today.